Usually when we talk about migration, we focus on government policy and rhetoric and the effect it has on asylum seekers. But we don't often talk about the effect it has on the British public. Successive governments, Tory and Labour, have fired up anti-migration sentiment as a way to win votes. And, predictably, that has widened what people find acceptable to think and say in public. This is Patricia, who called into Radio 5 Live on Friday to make this proposal about the small boat crossings. Patricia, you think we should be hard line on this. Tell us more. Uh, you want my opinion? I do. That's what it's all about. <laughs> right. Um, I, I think um, it's very tough, and I'm sorry if there will be some death. I truly am sorry about that. But we should not let them land. Sorry, what did you say? We should not let the boats land. No, the, the bit before you... Um, I, I'm truly sorry that we, there will be some deaths because when, when the boats turn back, um, there will be some deaths and that's really, really a, a bad thing. But if we, they will then stop coming. What do you say to that? What do you say to that? People are dying. People are still coming. Uh, the same woman, I presume, she says, Britain's a Christian country. Oh, well, if they die, they die. You can't have them both, love. Uh, just a day later, six people drowned in the channel trying to make the crossing. And following that tragedy, Tricia Goddard read out this message on Talk TV. We've got messages. Um, there's lots and lots of things here. Uh, migrants. Um, uh, Ukraine is a developed first world European democracy where most people live in exactly the same we do are highly educated, have virtually the same culture and values, and who will want to return home as soon as their war is over. Afghanistan is a third world country whose culture has no similarity to ours, where they throw gay people off a roof. Maybe those people who are trying to escape were gay people, um, and whose people are highly and whose people are highly uneducated, so can do little to our nation's prosperity. Why would you need to ask the question why we could assimilate 150k Ukrainians with ease unless you want the answer to be race orientated? Chris, wow, there's a lot of assumptions there. A lot of the Afghani people who um, wanted to come out were people that, who were dual language. They were professors. They were doctors who'd worked with the British. In fact, a high, high number of them were professional art, professional people. It's important to say that Trisha Goddard is absolutely correct in that regard, by the way. We just know this, that statistically people that engage in the kind of migration that we're seeing from Afghanistan, they, they, they tend to be the quote-unquote most privileged people from their communities. Uh, the most highly qualified, access to capital, uh, able-bodied, etc. So she was left pretty speechless by that message, but she threw it over to refugee specialist Lou Calvi, who gave this humane rebuttal to what was said. That's really affected me. It was difficult to hear you read that, if I'm honest, Tricia, but it, it, I would like the opportunity to, to respond to Chris directly, if that would be okay. Yeah, please do. Um, First of all, I would say that uh, in 2022, 8,600 people from Afghanistan crossed on small boats. And in the same time period, the British government offered safety to 22 people from Afghanistan under pathway two of ACRS. 22 people got that safe route in a whole year. Now, going back to what Chris said, the bottom line is the people from Afghanistan supported this government in Afghanistan. They fought for 20 with, years, 20 years, 20 years. They fought with our armed forces. They worked for peace. They worked for the right to educate girls, to educate their daughters so that their daughters could go to school. The daughters could go to college. And I was in that airport during Operation Pitting, welcoming the Afghans that managed to crush through the airport in Kabul. They were charging past Taliban fighters, desperately trying to get safety because they knew the fate that befell them once the Taliban took over. I was in that airport and I listened to those stories. I listened to the people that we managed to get out and the stories of the people that they had to leave behind because the evacuation was so chaotic. I met 
fathers, mothers that had been separated from their children in the evacuation. I met children that had been separated from their parents. To suggest that those people somehow don't deserve our help because they're less than us, they're less than Ukrainians, it's frankly offensive. It's a disgusting way to feel and think. And Chris needs to have a word with himself because clearly Chris's attitude towards refugees and asylum seekers are motivated by racism. Absolutely spot on. Of course, it's about racism. Oh, it's a high GDP country. Ukraine is a, is a moderately poor country. Uh, there are there are very pe- wealthy people from parts of the global south who, who can't get here, principally because of the colour of their skin. The idea that it's about education and wealth and all these things is complete nonsense. It's, 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 it's about their race. Let's, let's be real. They're white Europeans. On the Afghanistan thing as well, I just find this so remarkable. Somebody's half Iranian. The British government right now has sanctions on Afghanistan and Iran. Now, you might think those are legitimate. You might say, well, that's a very good tool. I don't, by the way. That's a very good tool to change regime. There's very little evidence of that, but fine. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to economically strangle a country, you have to also accept that some people will try and leave that country and seek a better life. And so you have people like the two disgusting human beings, frankly. We just talked about one who wrote something down and and the other person who called in Radio 5 Live. They would say, well, we can't take everybody. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning. Let's stop invading these countries. Let's stop imposing sanctions on these countries. And if you say, well, the Taliban, well, we tried to get rid of the Taliban. The CIA supported the rise of the Taliban in the early 1990s. So many failures of foreign policy. And we still use things like sanctions, which don't work. Mike, what do you make of this? I mean, look, I think it's very hard for most people in this country to really understand the relationship between foreign policy and the fact that many people are are trying to come here. Now, I understand there are people coming from countries which have nothing to do with foreign policy, but if you look at the leading sources of of people entering Europe from overseas or sort of undocumented migrants, principally Syrians, Afghans, Iraqis, Iranians, but it feels so hard for so many people just to put two and two together. Why is that? I think there's this like lack of understanding about Britain's role in creating these crises and, and Britain's role globally in terms of you know, invading nations, bombing nations, as you mentioned earlier, and in some ways creating the conditions for these crises that later exist, those links aren't that well drawn out in, 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 in our media, in our, in our discourse. So what often happens is we see the, the migrant crisis and the focus is on the migrant crisis. Well, it's not on the three or four years where Britain were involved in, in a particular country that led up to the migrant crisis that, that we now experience. So I think it's just drawing those links in our popular discourse in, in the media. Those links aren't, aren't drawn out that well. And I think a lot of this, a lot of our discussion about immigration in this country is so inherently racialized. Let's be absolutely clear about this. It's a particular type of migrant that's not welcomed here. You know, these people are seen as incompatible with Britain. They're, they're framed as the security threats. A lot of this is, is a legacy of the post-9-11 war on terror that was pursued by, by Blair, by Bush, where you know people of a particular complexion, people from particular parts of the world are viewed as, as you know, these are terrorists, these are people who are going to be a threat to our nation, these are people who are incapacitable, they come to this country and just live in these in their own areas, they don't, in, they don't mix. You know, all of these things, all of these myths that people buy into are really, really dangerous. And I think, again, we should be accommodating to those in need, especially when we have literally created the conditions for the migrant crisis to some extent. You know, we should be, you know, compassionate and, and show empathy to these people. And I think, you know, the reason why I'm so, I guess, frustrated with Labour who don't push back on on this, you know, this kind of rhetoric that Conservatives put out, this kind of hostile rhetoric that Conservatives put out on asylum, is because that's why you have calls like the lady that we heard about, and you know, almost it's like they just kind of like this glee at their suffering, it's just, it's really malicious, it's really, really nasty. So I think there does need to be a concerted effort by the, the Labour Party to kind of push back on, on this rhetoric. Now, Labour, look, their history of immigration is far more complex than people realise. I and mean, people seem to think the Conservatives, you know, Unit Powell and, and that legacy, they're the only bad guys when it comes to immigration, hostile environments, as we, as we all remember, the Windrush scandal, all of these things. But Labour's history when it comes to migration actually is pretty sketchy to put it mildly you know i remember david blunkett in the, in the mid north speaking about asylum seekers swamping schools and you know refugees should go back and build their own countries so let's be clear labor historically have been a party that have you know espoused quite clearly and quite quite explicitly anti-asylum rhetoric so i think you know what we need to happen moving forward is 
in the Labour Party to adopt more progressive stances, but also, you know, I think, you know, moving beyond kind of electoral politics as the OD venue for change, I think we, you know, on the left, you know, we can present a more progressive, you know, nation vision of, of Britain, you know, one that doesn't exclude people based on, you know, where they come from, and, and one that's compassionate and loving, one that understands that we have a duty as a nation to help those in suffering, and actually, that can be part of our identity as a nation, rather than, you know, nostalgia for empire, rather than this kind of like hostile version of Britain. The Britain that we want to believe in is a Britain that treats everyone, doesn't use words like asylum or refugee seat. We These are human beings at the end of the day. These are people that deserve our respect, deserve our love, and deserve to be treated like human beings, not held on barges, not, you know, we don't laugh at their death, we don't exploit their death. You know, we treat these people with respect and we try and, you know, provide them with safe routes to enter this country and live a decent life. Mike, quickly, you know, you're you're black. I'm I'm half Iranian, so we're like, we're not like white Brits. We're both BAME. Do you, do you think that this narrative, this discourse, do you think it's bleeding in now to how people look at you and me? Because I, I do really feel a rising animosity increasingly to not white people. And I have to say, look, a lot of this is on Twitter, right? Which is it's never a good barometer for anything. Uh, but since Elon Musk has bought it, you've obviously seen, uh, you know, the, the, the floodgates have opened with regards to all kinds of stuff, white nationalism, etc. And I see the sorts of comments and things being said in regards to people who are raised here, who've been born here, but who aren't white British, which frankly, you know, Obviously, I didn't expect it to disappear, but I didn't think I'd see the scale and intensity of it so publicly in the 2020s, frankly. Do you think something's changing with regards to our, our national conversation around race and identity as well, for the worse? And, and do you think that has any relationship to what's going on with the, the quote-unquote small boats crisis? Potentially, I do think that Twitter Twitter is a hostile place, right? So I've I remember when I was writing about race and, and, and I was writing some articles for the Independence, I think it was, and I received this really long email from a guy who essentially told me to go back home. And I think for for us as, as you know, people, ethnic minorities, often when we complain about Britain, or we say you know there's an issue with Britain when it comes to racism, or there's an issue with Britain when it comes to how they treat a particular group of people, whether it's you know the issue of issue of housing or homelessness, whatever it might be. You know, it's like go back home. You're essentially, your Britishness is seen as contingent, right? So you just you, you stay here, you keep quiet, you live a nice life, and you know you just you just shut up about the problems that exist in this country. So I think what's what's happened is some people have this kind of tear of Britishness, where it's like if you're you know white, you are you know pure British. You you know have there's no doubts about your status in this country. If you're a person that you know an ethnic minority, maybe you know. Most people would view you as as, an, as you know someone who's British, but the moment you complain about Britain, the moment you voice any concerns about this nation and want to make it a better place, a more loving place, a more you know, compassionate place, the moment you do that, that's when you're like, whoa, you know, if you don't like it here, go back home. So, I, I think this actually legacy can I think about post Brexit really and how that emboldened some particular groups, and we saw hate crimes against minorities rise in the immediate aftermath of the of the result being announced. So. I actually think this is part of a, a wider trend. Maybe you can tr you can try trace this back all the way back to some of the stuff New Labour said about asylum seekers and about migrants, and about refugees, and you know John Major's government and and, and and Thatcher. This has been a long, an ongoing process with successive governments and you know right wing newspapers, etc. You know, spewing some really hostile stuff about migrants. You know, and you know that becoming more mainstream. We have Brexit, and we see the hate crimes after Brexit. And I think there is this sense among some people that. You know, even though, you know, I was born in this country, I was raised in this country, my Britishness isn't, you know, complete. It's not because I because of my because of my my skin colour. You know, that's that's obviously a, a huge issue. So yeah, I think this is part of kind of a wider trend of, you know, anti immigrant rhetoric that's kind of existed for a while and, and, and both both major parties have played a role in it. So so yeah, it's a part of a wider trend, I think.